Greetings, and welcome to Theology Thursdays. We continue our series over Andrew Davison's book, Why Sacraments. If you want to pick up this book to read along with us, there will be a link in the description of this video that you can go and purchase your own copy. We start by thinking about character. What does character mean? You might have heard it referred to as perhaps like an old piece of art or an old piece of furniture as that has character. Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, to put it in craftsman's terms, character can mean a particular style. You can tell that a certain kind of craftsman has made something, a certain type of artist has painted a painting. It has what we would say a particular imprint of that person on that particular piece you're looking at. It has their stamp on it, or quite literally, their tool markings on it. They have shaped, molded, painted, layered, all the various things that go into giving this piece or this piece of furniture character. But character goes even deeper than that, right? Characters such as those who are in movies or TV shows that portray particular characters, and good actors, those who portray characters well, enter into a fundamentally particular kind of way to a mold of a person that that actor is not, but that they are playing. They are playing the character of someone. They are conforming themselves to act after a certain character, a certain personality. Well, the word character is actually found in Holy Scripture as well, and in one of the most important passages of Holy Scripture that, it ha that has to do with our living in Christ-likeness. Andrew Davison points out that this particular word shows up in one place in the New Testament, but in perhaps one of the most powerful images in all of the New Testament. It shows up in the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews says the following about character. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he has created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and, here's the word, the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. The word used there the Greek word, is a word that often is used to imply engraving, imprinting, an actual uh, sort of um, physical pressing down of something. You can think about uh, such as like a signet ring that you press into wax that leaves a particular imprint upon it. Sacramental character is indeed like that imprint. We are imprinted with Christ, and therefore we live into that character of Christ. And in sacramental theology, there are particular sacraments that take on what we would, what we would say a character of Christ. They are a way that Christ imprints on us his own image, his own likeness, that we might also be conformed into the likeness of Christ. And the sacraments in which this character of imprinting happens in a very particular way are four of them. Baptism, confirmation, marriage, and ordination. We'll talk about those in their turns. We talked about baptism last time, but it's helpful to get straight that there are different ways of thinking about sacraments. And for these sacraments, the sacraments of character, we need to think about it in a very real objective way that Christ has imprinted upon us 
a certain character. And as St. Paul and his Hebrews would say, it is indeed the character of Christ himself. Have you ever thought about what your name means? Does it have a particular meaning that derives from other meanings? Your first name, your real name, your last name could be any number of these particular things. But names impart character. And in fact, this is so deeply biblical that we sometimes miss it. People who receive names in Holy Scripture receive those names not by accident. And in fact, in some of the most moving parts of all of Holy Scripture, God renames some people to mean certain things. He gives them names. Think, for example, Abraham. Abram is what he was called. Abraham is what his name was changed to when God said, you shall be the father of many nations. Think about some of Abraham's grandchildren, which is Esau and Jacob. Now, what's funny is that so Jacob and Esau are twins. Esau comes out, and his name literally means Harry. He comes out and he was Harry. But Jacob is an interesting one because when Esau came out of the womb first, Jacob reached and grabbed Esau's heel. The word Jacob in Hebrew literally means heel grabber. And heel grabber uh, takes on a character of deceiver, of one who uh, works behind the scenes to his own ends. Which, by the way, if we look at the way that Jacob lives his life, he certainly lives into the character of his name. But also, we have when Jesus renames St. Peter. Simon was his name, and Jesus gives him another name, Cephas, Peter. You shall be known as Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And then, throughout the rest of the New Testament, we don't really know Simon as Simon. We know him as Peter. Names impart a character. Or, at least at the, at the very least, names imply a character, are appropriate to a character. Well, it's no accident that in the Christian tradition, especially in the sacraments of character, such as baptism, confirmation, marriage, and ordination, all of these involve a particular taking on of a new name. In the Episcopal Church, if you look in the Book of Common Prayer, there even is a particular form within these rites of someone might take on a new name, and by that time you will know them by these names. This is a very ancient practice. The whole taking on of what we would sometimes refer to as your Christian name is indeed a sign that something has been imprinted upon someone. This is very usual in the ways that our Christian monastics take their vows in part of their monastic vows. They vow to celibacy, they vow to chastity, to poverty, but they also often take on a new name. Jose Maria, Joseph, Mary, they take on new names in order to signify an imprinting of Christ in a particular fashion has taken place. And likewise, in baptism, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. You are imprinted by Christ. Some people take new names in baptism. In confirmation, some people take new names in confirmation. Marriage might be the most obvious one of these, where someone takes on new names. In our modern society, some people actually combine their names together, both of their last names. The traditional fashion is for the uh, bride to take on the last name of the groom, or for 
one of the married party to take on the name of the other to signify there has been an imprinting of character that has happened in a particular fashion in marriage, which we'll talk about here in several weeks. But sacramental character is objectively past. And one of the ways that we say that is a sign of this objective imprinting of Christ is in fact nomenclature, what we are known by, by our new names. But that imprinting of character is for a particular direction and purpose. It's not just something that we get together and, okay, Christ has stamped us, and so we're good. It's not a rubber stamp, if that makes sense. Rather, the imprinting of sacramental character is a means to an end. It's not the end in and of itself. Baptism is not it, and then we're done. Confirmation is not it, and then we're done. Marriage, goodness knows marriage is not, we get through the ceremony and then we're done. I sure hope that that's not how marriage works. Ordination. I mean, if ordination was just getting through the service and then we're done, the church would be in a very poor place right now, right? Rather, sacramental character is a plunging in to the designation of being conformed to Christ. And one of the fundamental aspects of sacramental character is worship. Baptism, someone being baptized into Christ's death and resurrection establishes them as a worshiper of the triune God. In other words, we are not baptized into just anything. We're baptized particularly into Christ Jesus, and therefore it establishes us as disciples and worshipers of Christ Jesus. Confirmation particularly means that we are confirmed in the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. We, are, we have the hands of the bishop placed upon us, really, in a very real way, establishing the line of succession from the apostles themselves all the way to this person who's being confirmed so that that person can take part in the governance and the life of the church in a deeper fashion. They are no longer just someone who is worshiping as the baptized. They are also taking leadership in the church as laity and clergy. Marriage. This might sound uh, in some ways uh, countercultural, but actually it is something very deep within the Christian tradition itself. Marriage establishes the couple they get married as worshipers of Jesus. They come to be joined together by the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in that, they are establishing themselves as a worshiping family. There are promises that are made within the marriage ceremony of promising to be one as God is one. They promise to love each other as Christ loves the church. They promise to raise a family in the faith of Christ. They are pledging to be worshipers. And likewise, the sacrament of marriage establishes them as worshipers. And most, most especially ordination establishes someone as a worshiper in a particular fashion. The character of deacons, priests, and bishops are stamped by Christ in a particular fashion of facilitating worship, of administrating the sacraments, of particular care for the poor in our community, of particular administration of the one holy Catholic apostolic church, such as the bishop does. But all of these are establishments of worship. We are not stamped by just anything. We are indelibly stamped by Jesus into the tradition of Christianity, into the working of the Holy Spirit that has continued to work through the Christian tradition even up to modern day. And we are likewise uh, commissioned, so to speak, as worshipers of God.
Jesus doesn't mess up when the sacraments are given. Sacraments are a means of objective grace, which means that the grace in the sacraments cannot be expunged by any human means, even human sin. That's what we refer to in the Christian tradition as these particular sacraments of character. We refer to these sacraments as being indelible. They cannot be expunged or rubbed out. When one is baptized, you're always baptized. When one is confirmed, you are always confirmed. When one is married, you're always married. When one is ordained, you're always ordained. But I, I, I hear the questions already, <laughs> even though I can't hear you. I know, I know that there are questions of, but doesn't someone leave, don't people leave the faith all the time? Don't marriages end in divorce all the time? Don't deacons, priests, and bishops sort of leave their particular faith all the time? Well, guess what? We know this. In Dante's Inferno, um, Dante in his Divine Comedy, in the Inferno, in other words, when Dante is being shown through hell, um, the harrowing experience uh, that that is, there are deacons, priests, and bishops in hell in Dante's Inferno. It adds all the more, as Davison says, to the tragedy, which is that human sin can mar even the greatest of grace. However, we have to be very careful about the way we talk about grace being communicated. Because we take so seriously, as we talked about last time in baptism, we take so seriously that it is God acting in these particular sacraments. It's not us that's doing the sacrament. It's God doing it. Augustine was fairly clear that in baptism, we don't have the power to erase what God has done. Well, now we have the question, right? Well, what does it mean for someone to have been baptized or confirmed or married or ordained and then to forsake that particular sacrament. Well, the church has had a very careful way of treating this. We treat it as being indelible. We don't say it's not there. However, what we say is that we leave it up to the grace of God in all of these cases. It's especially hard in two of these, in marriages and ordination. Confirmation and baptism, in a lot of ways, is easier to deal with from a theological perspective than marriage and ordination. For someone to forsake their ordination, for someone to forsake their marriage, for a divorce to happen is a tragedy. And for people who have gone through those, it's a tragedy. We know this intuitively. No one chooses to do that. However, there is a distinction between the grace of God not working, not being communicated, and our wills willing something else than the good. Take, for example, ordination. There have been examples in fairly most areas of life within the church recently, where there have been priests, deacons, bishops even that have come out and have basically said that they don't know if they believe in God anymore. You can find examples of this all over the place. What does that mean for one's ordination? Or, take it this way, someone has been caught in a particular scandal such as bribery, such as something canonically inappropriate, such as abuse, whether it be physical, sexual, so on and so forth, by someone who's supposed to be the pastor and shepherd of someone. Well, the church does have a way of responding to this, which is that we don't say that the cleric in question is not in the wrong and should not be removed from active ministry. Indeed, this happens. 
It's unfortunate, but it does happen. We don't say that ordination didn't happen, but what we say is that what has happened or occurred is such a scandal to the faithful that they are removed from leadership roles. Now, sometimes this is referred to as being laicized, as the clergy being made into a layperson. That's something we need to be careful about. Rather, what we usually talk about is, is this person able to serve an appropriate role in what they have been ordained in? The answer in, in some of these cases is no. And so they are barred from exercising pastoral authority due to the sinful behavior that has come to light, which is indeed a truly tragic process. But let's think about it in a more kind of rudimentary fashion. When marriages fall apart, indeed, it is a tragedy. But a helpful distinction in this case is maybe something a little bit to do with Roman Catholic theology that we as Protestants can maybe take a couple of um, a couple pointers from. There's a reason why the Roman Catholic Church talks about an annulling a marriage rather than divorce. Because annulling of a marriage basically is declaring that the marriage didn't exist in the first place. I'll share a story from a colleague of mine where they are going through premarital counseling with a couple that have come. And these two have come together, a man and a woman who want to be married. And as they're going through premarital counseling, the woman is doing most of the talking. The man is kind of aloof, kind of reserved. And the priest very perceptively looks at the man and says, do you want to be married? And the man very frankly says to the priest, well, this was all her idea, referring to the um, fiance. And at that moment, this priest said, I cannot witness and bless the marriage. Because as we'll talk about in marriage, marriage is not something that we as priests do. It's something that the couple is doing that we are witnessing to in sacraments. But what would have happened if those two had been solemnly before God, they witnessed and they said that they were getting married in the church? The question that Roman Catholics would ask is, did this marriage actually exist at all? Was this actually something that was working in both of them? This is a fair question in that case. And indeed, we can perhaps think about other circumstances where is the couple coming together actually in marriage or is it in something else? Are they actually being brought together? Again, a key word here. Are they being brought together by the imprint of Christ? Is a sacrament able to be witnessed by the priest who is about to do this marriage? That's a helpful distinction between these things. Hence why, in the Roman Catholic Church, those who may have been civilly married can have their marriage annulled if there is cause to believe that there was not an actual sacramental marriage in the first place. So the distinction between civil marriage or sacramental ideas of marriage, there's a distinction in these two things. Does that mean that divorces still don't happen? Of course they still happen. But we have to understand that sacramentally, the communication of the grace of God does not get rubbed out by any marring of sin that we might have. Just as we can rightly say that in baptism we are fully saved by Christ and that there's not anything that removes our baptism. So also in these sacraments of character, we have to both balance the sinfulness of humanity with 
the utter grace of God that cannot be thwarted by any human activity. And so in these sacraments of character, we talk about the imprinting of Christ on us in a way that is not taken away. It is something that is pressed into us. It is an imprint in us. And perhaps in a more practical fashion, when we live counter to that imprint of Christ in us, we actually spiritually, emotionally, sometimes physically sense that we are not living according to what we say we are. We are living out of accordance with that imprint so deep within us that when we do live into that imprinting of Christ, we are formed all the more into the image of Christ. And in the sacraments of character, we take seriously that it is Jesus forming us and not we ourselves.